Hi everyone, uh, welcome to Kering Discourse. My name is uh, Maria Grazia Rossi and uh, I'm a researcher at the Nova Institute of Philosophy within the Argumentation and uh, Reasoning Lab. My institute is currently in this wonderful building, Collegio Almada Negreros, in uh, the Campo Lide campus of the Universidad de Nova de Lisboa. But of course, today I'm talking to you from home. I have uh, the great pleasure today of opening, opening up the Caring Discourse Initiative, that is a space for uh, discussing topics, projects, initiatives, and at exploring the power of words and language in the context of healthcare communication. Today, we look at the hashtag Reframe COVID movement and uh, talk with two of its founders to understand why metaphors are so per pervasive in the context of the current COVID-19 pandemic. We'll try to explore how some ways of speaking uh, influence the way we think about what's going on and how they influence the way people behave. But first, uh, let me tell you a little more about the Caring Discourse series. In each episode, we will discuss a topic about communication and healthcare with uh, academic and non-academic ex experts from Portugal, where uh, I'm broadcasting from, as well as uh, uh, from abroad. Caring Discourse uh, uh, is uh, um, designed to allow you, the viewer, to interact with our expert guest. You can contact me uh, before the episode and uh, be here, video live, in the second part of the uh, encounter, participating in the discussion with your own uh, questions and uh, ideas. But uh, anyone during the live stream has the opportunity to ask questions or, or leave uh, comments using the chat and we'll try to get to as many as possible speaking of guests i think it's time to get uh, to the heart of caring discourse so um, it's my pleasure to introduce to you ines olza and uh, Paula Perez Sobrino. Welcome to Green Discourse and thanks for accepting my invitation. Well, it's all our pleasure. Yeah, thanks so much for the invite. Thank you, Madre Grazia. We are very happy to be here. I'm happy to. So um, before we begin, let me say a few words on your work as researchers. Uh, so, Ines is a tenure researcher in, linguistic, in linguistics at the Institute for Culture and Society of the uh, Universidad de Navarra in uh, Spain. 
the Institute for Culture and Society is uh, an interdisciplinary research center for the humanities and social sciences, where she works mainly on multimodal pragmatics and discourse analysis dealing with language use in the public sphere. Uh, Ines leads the Multimodal Pragmatics Lab and the Knowledge Generation Project Multinet on multimodal patterns for negation and disagreement. Paula works at the Universidad de La Rioja at the Modern Philology Department as a Cognitive Linguist. Paula has been working on multimodality, in particular uh, her work is on patterns of interaction between multimodal metaphor and metonymy in advertising. She is a Marie Curie Fellow, having been the principal investigator of the Exploring Multimodal uh, Metaphor in Advertising project hosted by the University of Birmingham in the UK. So, um, I think uh, uh, we can start talking about the hashtag uh, reframe COVID movement. So, I um, uh, would start with Ines. Why don't you tell us why you started the reframe COVID initiative and what it's about? Well, um, it was a, a pretty spontaneous initiative. Could you please show my slides, Maria Grazia? <laughs> so, um, Everything started up in, in Twitter um, on a Sunday afternoon. I was listening to our prime minister, Pedro Sanchez, addressing the nation. And of course, um, the amount of war metaphors he was using struck me. And I decided to uh, open a Twitter conversation, uh, adding uh, or mentioning also my fellow colleagues in Twitter. Uh, about these use of war metaphors. And my first aim was to propose sort of a recipe book of alternative ways of talking about the pandemic. So the point was perhaps to um, spread that kind of images uh, where we propose different metaphors. Um, and all these came inspired by uh, another initiative, scientifically grounded initiative, um, started up by Elena Semino and her team at Lancaster University. Uh, they set up a metaphor menu for cancer patients um, to propose alternative ways to look at the disease. So the, the good news was that um, other linguists and citizens, um, journalists, um, sort of uh, expressed the same kind of concern. Um, it seemed that our, our, our conversation and the hashtag created by Paula attracted their attention and channeled their worries. And then uh, Veronica Kohle from uh, the Lancaster University as well decided to set up uh, a common, open, uh, crowdsourced um, spreadsheet to collect that kind of alternative metaphors. So anybody can contribute to it. Uh, either by bringing examples um, coined by journalists, politicians, or citizens, or creating their, their own examples. So we have a web page as well, but I mean, this is not the aim of, you know, advertising our web page. So let's, let's you know, stick to this spontaneous uh, start of the Reframe COVID initiative. So I think that's, that's pretty much it. That's pretty much it. Um, uh, I'm happy that you mentioned Elena Semino because she will be our uh, next guest expert here at Caring Discourse uh, to tell us more about this very interesting initiative met, uh, about the metaphor menu for people living with cancer. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Paula, as uh, Ines just said, you started using the hashtag uh, Reframe COVID on Twitter, and uh, it's great to see how this has gained traction, becoming a movement with a strong, open and collaborative spirit. Um, could you share with us a little more about your vision on that? Mm -hmm, of course. Um... Yeah, for me, the most important thing and also the most beautiful thing is how, as you said, how open and collaborative this initiative is. And like I've heard it somewhere that some people call this the Reframe COVID project. 
and uh, this is not a project. Is this this is just a crowdsourcing initiative of um, of people who felt similarly. And the only thing we did was to channel or to find uh, or to put all these thoughts in the same Twitter thread. So, by no means is anything big for now. Um, so as I said, this is a resource, it's not a project, it's a resource for people to use. And the most amazing thing is how people were into that idea from the get-go. Um, it was, um, I think, and as you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think as of today, this spreadsheet that Veronica um, created has over 400 multimodal examples. So not just in text, but also in cartoons and, and songs as well, uh, in 20 languages and over 40 researchers have collaborated. So I think it is really important that all these people are uh, credited anytime that this spreadsheet is going to be used. And of course, we're only here speaking on behalf of all of them. And another thing that is really that I think is very, very important is that, um, as Ines mentioned, this is just is meant, it was meant initially, and I hope this is the spirit as of today, as a book of recipes or like, uh, to, yeah, a way to find alternative frames for the COVID pandemic. So by no means is meant to be prescriptive. That's really, really important here. Um, I think we will, I hope we can have the chance to discuss more about this at the end, but definitely the, the, the idea now is to find out more about what frames or what metaphors are useful in which, mo which moments and uh, who are using those frames and whether they're effective or not. And so uh, I'm going to now uh, uh, move on, but before I finish, I would just like to um, reassess again that this is meant to be, is a resource that is meant to be, uh, be used by people. So this is, um, we would like to uh, take advantage of this opportunity to call uh, to call people or, or to uh, issue a call for action uh, to remind everyone that this resource is there to be used. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Paula, I'd like to uh, step back for a moment. Mm -hmm. Um, this collaborative initiative, Reframe COVID, was po possible because people were using so many different metaphors and frame, uh, frames while uh, talking about the virus about, and the disease and the entire situation. But why are people even using metaphors in the first place? Why have metaphors become so uh, prevalent when talking about the COVID-19 crisis? Okay, good. Um, of course, uh, these metaphors are really highly motivated and they're very entrenched in culture. So a metaphor uh, entails, the ex a metaphor explores the, com the, the similarities between two ideas. So initially, uh, there are lots of similarities between war scenarios and the COVID, the COVID pandemic. So they both uh, posit a threat to life and they both need, uh, uh, there is a, they both need to take measures urgently. So, um, yeah, of course, the mapping is motivated, but we should also know that this mapping is partial. So it's not that these two things are equally the same. Um, in that sense, that metaphors are framing devices because they highlight certain similarities between two ideas. And of course, they uh, shadow others. And another interesting thing is that if you can uh, please show my slides, um, unlike traditional accounts of metaphor as an embellishment of poems and so on, Metaphor is rather a matter of thought because it, it, it offers a window or a door to our thought, our ways of thinking. So, of course, this is we can see metaphors that are verbally manifested, like the ubiquitous uh, invisible enemy, enemy by Donald Trump, um, or the wartime president. So they both exploit uh, this um, similarity to war verbally, but we can also find them in images. So if you can move forward, please. Yeah, you can see with. Now these have, these have become uh, so familiar, so conventional that we, we cannot say that they're actually creative. So you can see here doctors and nurses and chefs that are uh, in trenches, exploiting this idea they are, that they are the soldiers at the front line, and also the nets as bombs in, in, in the other image. And more interestingly, we can also see these metaphors in gestures so, of course, this is the source of my non-very systematic scientific review. But if you move forward to my next slide, uh, this is also from the first address of our president, Pedro Sanchez, when he communicated that we were, we, that we were going to enter <laughs> in the lockdown. So you see here the closed fist. 
he used it recurrently to refer to a fight, to fight the vir virus, of course, so this would be um, a metonymy, the fist for the fight, but also kind of evo evoking this wider war scenario. And he, interestingly, he also used it to refer to the feeling of togetherness and the need to be together, yeah, as if we were like this. Um, so, as I said, it's uh, now it's time to see whether how pervasive they are and how they differ from countries to countries. But in a, in a, if anything, what matters here is that meta was a pervasive element of thought that, as you can see, permeates all types of communication. Another interesting aspect of metaphor is that it emerged from the shared knowledge in a culture. So if you move forward to my next slide, that perhaps only, I'm not sure to what extent it's going to make sense outside Spain, but um, as you can see here, we saw this several times, the, um, the, evo well, the evocation or some cartoons making use of El Quixote and also in the bottom line, that's San Jordi, which is a patron saint of Catalonia, um, also the patron saint of books. And you, what you can see there is white Spaniards prefer heroes without superpowers. And so this is also the idea, it's evoking the idea that we need to fight the virus, but it's less epic, that, less epic than uh, what we've seen in some media, like as these doctors being superheroes or, or soldiers, that um, unbeatable soldiers and so on. Some people prefer more humble stories of people that just have ideals and do their best to fight the virus. So, as I said, it matched from shared knowledge, and in that sense, it can cohere or bring the a society together. And finally, and we will come back to this later, what another interesting aspect of metaphors is that they don't they don't know, they do not only uh, bring to the fore all this encyclopedic knowledge that we have from wars, but they also bring uh, about bring up all the emotional load of a given scenario. So it's not just about all the different uh, characters involved in a war, but also the feelings that are the feelings that are brought up in, uh, with that. I will talk about, more about this later. Yes, may I add a couple of things, you know, to wrap up what Paula explained about why metaphor in the COVID crisis or why metaphor in all sorts of discourse. Exactly. So this is not only an issue of public communication, strategic communication. I mean, this is daily, daily communication. I mean, we all use metaphors because they are, I mean, these analogies uh, work in our minds. Mm -hmm. So we are, we are talking about daily discourse, political discourse, um, and also specialized health discourse. And I think, you know, uh, doctors, healthcare workers uh, are also aware of the importance of framing things in, um, in a constructive, emotionally, you know, uh, motivating way. So, of course, metaphors are also crucial for doctor-patient interaction and also for framing complex scenarios and very, very um, sort of abstract things like uh, everything that's going on nowadays. So, of course, the virus as such is very concrete, but we cannot see it. So um, we are proposing to rethink all these, you know, invisible threat scenario in, in, in other terms. So that's, you know, to wrap up a little bit mm -hmm. what Paula said. Thanks, yes. And uh, also, uh, Ines, uh, the thing is that war metaphors proliferated, especially at the beginning. So, but uh, why are war metaphors so pervasive? Well, uh, could you please share my, my slides? Um, of course, I mean, war metaphors uh, are there and will go on. I mean, and we are not banning them because I use war metaphors as well to frame negative experiences or to motivate myself to fight and to beat uh, negative things. So um, uh, we cannot deny that these metaphors can even be extremely useful at the very beginning of um, a, a pandemic. So I think it was Macron, one of the first ones who actually said, I mean, and reflected upon the frame, nous sommes en guerre. If we want to call up for unity, um, sacrifice, collective sacrifice, discipline, 
resilience, of course, war metaphors are quite useful. If we want to convey the seriousness of this uh, pandemic, of this health urgency, of course, we can also use these, you know, battlefront, <laughs> these battlefront images, yeah, because uh, nobody can hide these these uh, serious reality. So we claim that these metaphors can be extremely useful at certain stages of public communication, of daily communication. Um, the problem is, 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 is that abusing um, and sustaining them along a really long time might be uh, or might distort a little bit the pandemic. I think Paola will explain uh, hmm. more I about know. that. So it's a negative process going on a long time we need a structured response. So, uh, of course, we can use war metaphors at certain points. Yeah. Pa Paola, and before you, you were talking about um, the importance of uh, the emotional aspects, uh, which actually emphasize the powerful effect uh, of metaphors in uh, the way we look at the world and how we reason about the world. So, which do you think are the relevant emotional aspects that characterize the war metaphors used to talk about the current pandemic? Yeah, of course. So it's not that just wars are sad and they're meant to be to be to depress us or anything. We definitely it was very useful to evoke this scenario, especially at the beginning to convey to everyone that they should be taken we should take this very very seriously it was an it was a matter of urgency um, some measures need to be taken and people should uh, should understand understand that like quite fast in a matter of hours so i thought well i think there or I, I think we can agree that they were very very useful especially at the beginning to set a mood in which people need to take this very seriously do not hesitate and and also to highlight the fact that we need to act together so, so that we don't underestimate the threat that that was posited. So the, these emotions also um, are not necessarily negative. Also, word metaphors are very helpful to highlight the need for responsibility, social responsibility, and social discipline. So it was very important to uh, launch this call for unity and cooperation among among different agents. Mm -hmm. But as Ines said, um, yeah, the only problem was that it sustained use over time. So at some point, it just it's not that they're just uh, depressing people. At some point, it loses efficiency. So it was that was basically what the purpose of the whole initiative to find alternative frames, especially after two weeks. I think it was when we launched this two weeks after uh, the beginning of the lockdown, at least in Spain. So I think around the, the end the end of March or so, when we thought it was time to move past this scenario and look at alternative ways to talk about the pandemic. So uh, um, it would be nice to go in greater uh, details with that. So Paula, uh, why do we need non-war frames at all? So picking up on what I just said, um, uh, we needed we need non-war metaphors, especially to address other aspects of the pandemic that go beyond the first stage in, of alarm. So in that sense, there is no single metaphor that rules them all. Yes. So we cannot just think that the word metaphor is going to solve all our communication problems, not just communication, but reasoning problems as well. Um, so the problem is that there are several problems with this. So um, they are not useful to convey long term processes. So the word metaphor might be useful for this flash war processes in which uh, in a matter of days um, a response is found. But in this case, we've, we've been here like for two, mo two months and it's unlikely that this is going to end anytime soon. So it might end up, frustra it might end up frustrating people because we don't see any uh, visible change in the near future. So uh, in that sense, I think I was Elena, I think I heard it from Elena Semino. There are other more useful metaphors like the fire metaphor in that uh, in this sense, the pandemic might be like a fire that you can put it out, but then it might emerge or start somewhere else. And it calls for observation and uh, like and to be vigilant. And so it's not that it's going to end anytime soon. Also, and as the pandemic develops, we need alternative views. Because if you think about it, uh, the word metaphor is not very useful to frame the lack of action that it, that it expected from us. So when, when we're at war, basically what you have to do is either to battle or to run and hide. But in this case, we cannot do one or either thing. So we just need to stay home and wait for anything to happen. And no one really knows what is this. So um, 
in that case, if you can show my first slide, one of the things that I thought it was interesting, uh, in Spain it was used for a brief period of time, the metaphor of hibernation. Uh, can you move to the next one, please? So the hibernation, uh, I thought that was interesting because it was a way to frame this lack of action as something positive. Uh, so in a sense that we should wait for the winter to be over, but in the meantime, we're kind of reserving or saving up our energies for the spring, which would be the world without the virus or something like that. Another idea uh, that I thought it was interesting is that there was, there was something about this word metaphor that uh, made doctors really fed up with it. So in my next slide, I think this was captured from the NHS, but it was, you could see it in Spain all over the place. Um, of course, this is not, it's not like a hundred percent solution. Like some doctors thought it was very useful, but the idea that some of the, some of them reject the fact that they were called soldiers or superheroes and also martyrs. I think I saw that somewhere. That's interesting. I, and of course we should pay attention to those people, uh, who are precisely in the front line. Um, because there are some studies in metaphor research that says that not everyone perceives the metaphor equally creative. Like people who are tremendously exposed to these metaphors in the end tend up thinking about them in literal terms as if they were really soldiers that are there to obey other, to obey order and to die if necessary. And that wasn't the case. I think we can all agree. And then finally, um, another aspect that is not covered by the word metaphor is the necessity for cooperation, but in a positive sense, cooperation for the common good versus collective attacks. So um, if you can see in the next metaphor, so we've seen some, some metaphors about boats and sports that are very useful. So they kind of reinforce this idea of the need to work together for something for the better. But uh, I thought this one was an, an interesting one. So it's, I think it's kind of playing on, on playing upon this uh, game in which you pull the rope uh, as a group. But as you can see, the rope is the curve, the famous curve. So in a way, it conveys the idea that together we can flatten the curve. It's not a matter of some vaccines or unknown doctors. So I thought that was an, an interesting way. And as you can see with these examples, um, it's not that we, it's not that there is one single non-word metaphor that is useful. We need to cover several angles and several perspectives of the pandemic to be effective in our way of to think and communicate about the crisis. Yeah, I mean, um, to pick up what Paula said, I think there are also some aspects of the pandemic that uh, might be even distorted if we keep on using the word metaphor. Uh, sometimes, I mean, politicians say, or quite often say that, I mean, we will defeat, we will beat that virus, and then the war will be over. And wars have a black and white end, and this is not the case. I mean, it seems that we will live uh, with the virus or <laughs> uh, we will be accompanied by the virus for a long time, for several months, uh, that, I mean, we'll have peaks and valleys in the, uh, in the pandemic as well. So framing things as um, if we, uh, uh, the pandemic will be over from one moment to another, I mean, can be even, you know, a distortion. Um, also, I mean, um, a negative evolution of the pandemic might be seen as a defeat of population. Mm -hmm. And we all acknowledge that there are certain factors that are beyond our control. I mean, we are told to stay home, to stay, to stay home to save lives. Uh, we are told that we are fighters, but perhaps we don't see uh, the results in, in the short term. So, I mean, this can generate a feeling of frustration as well. And um, this is the call for uh, perhaps alternative frames that underline other values, uh, other ways of framing things. Uh, for instance, we can contrast um, the war frame with the care frame in general. Solidarity, cooperation, I mean, Paula mentioned that. And all these alternative scenarios stress that caring uh, frame instead of the war frame. So if you can show this slide, I mean, this is kind of also a wrap up for what we said. I mean, instead of um, having a, a front line, a battle, <laughs> a battlefield, we have a boat where uh, there is a leader, there is a captain, of course, and we are all, you know, uh, putting efforts in, in defeating or going, you know, through the, through the pandemic. So um, other frames might uh, 
give a better account of what is happening. And that's our, our main claim, I would say. Okay, can, can, I, can I just yeah. wrap up what uh, Ines said? So basically, yeah. I think the main essence is that the use of metaphors as well as frames is always intentional. So I think uh, re reducing and simplifying the whole complexity of the crisis or the pandemic to one single metaphor, it's never, it's not by accident. So it's all part to, it's part from, it's all part of a communicative strategy by all the people in the media, not just politicians, but also journalists um, or lay people. So I think it's not just um, ethical, but it, I think it's also healthy for society to un understand how metaphors work, to wonder mm -hmm what might be the reason why these viruses could be compared to to a war or to whatever other idea. So, because whereas it might be useful to use the word, to evoke the word metaphor from now, every now and then, it might also lead to some people legitimizing some actions that at some point, that at some in some other situations, it wouldn't be acceptable. So, yeah, I'm not sure. Do you want to comment on that, Ines? Yes, I mean, for instance, if we compare the war metaphor with the hibernation metaphor, I mean, it's not by chance that the hibernation metaphor, which has natural even positive connotations of, you know, nature uh, renovating it itself, yeah, it's not by chance that it's applied to economics. Exactly. So, uh, I mean, politicians wanted to frame the lockdown in economic activity in terms of hibernation. So we were not fighting uh, against, you know, the virus while locking down our businesses or while, you know, stopping up the economy. So, of course, there is an intention in that. And we also we also have to uh, be critical with this. I mean, it doesn't mean that we destroy any kind of, you know, all kinds mm -hmm. of, you know, political public communication because it's not easy to communicate nowadays. We are all aware of the important role of politicians and um, um, institutions uh, to to frame and cope with this. But of course, I mean, as citizens, um, even I mean, if we, you can be linguist or not, I mean, as citizens, we are entitled to have a critical view. Um, on public discourse and how how metaphors uh, are intentionally used, I think. And I think one of the most beautiful things of the whole initiative is is that whereas it was mainly linguists taking care of this at the beginning, yeah. I think oh, we can agree that over the past few weeks, especially lay people like friends or people who are not familiar mm -hmm. with the notion of metaphor, are starting to share examples with us, as la uh, like sure. oh, so why this mountain example? What does this mean? Or so I think it's very interesting that people are starting to be more aware and conscious about the use of metaphors in political communication. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I think before taking questions from the public that uh, I see uh, people are very active, mm -hmm. uh, would you like to tell uh, us um, more about the future of the hashtag reframe COVID movement? Well, I, I would say, I mean, this is a collective movement. I mean, we already stressed that uh, it's not ours <laughs> by no means. So there are several resources if you want to collaborate and to bring examples. Okay. There's a spreadsheet, there's a web page as well. And I mean, our role is kind of a moderator role and to put things together. We, mm -hmm. we see ourselves as somehow mediators uh, of an overall feeling of um, a little bit uh, concern about these war metaphors. Um, of this feeling of uh, needing alternative frames. And I mean, that's our role. So what, you know, in, in, in I wanted just to bring, just to end up my, my part, I, I would say, yeah. Uh, we also um, uh, called uh, for cartoonists to join our initiative. Could you please show my slide, uh, Maria Grazia? Yeah. So one, possible future avenue for the reframe COVID thing uh, is to create visuals uh, that stress the importance of thinking about alternative frames. So we already have cartoonists, uh, you know, joining the initiative and sharing their work with us. Um, I think that for instance, that's a good example of, of the kind of spirit we have. Uh, cartoonists uh, somehow reflect uh, our feelings as citizens, but they have this public space to to publish and to spread their work. So, I mean, th this is the kind of collaborative thing we want to to uh, push 
and and to um um uh, you know uh boost <laughs> in the coming months i would say Good. um yes yeah, sorry yeah yeah i think you have something to add to this I will just wrap this up by saying that uh, the Reframe COVID initiative will live as much as people use it. So we definitely want to encourage people to make use of this resource. We're just speaking on behalf of many people who, who contributed to the resource. And what we would like to see is that people are starting to register studies, which can be of any nature. It can be corpus studies, it can be qualitative inquiries, it can be experimental. Because this project, what it does, in my, I think in my opinion, is that it opens more questions than it answers. So it still remains yeah. to be seen who is using which metaphors, in which context, and where, and especially when or at, at what specific periods of the whole pandemic, and which with which effects. Um, it's also, it also remains to be seen the differences between the languages. So if metaphors emerge from shared knowledge in a culture, uh, are the same metaphors being used in the in Asian countries as in Western countries? Uh, yeah. we, can, we definitely, I mean, that's that definitely, and especially in a global pandemic, that gives us an, an excellent opportunity to explore this. And as Ines commented, the role of images and humor and satire seems to be particularly useful. Mm -hmm. uh, no one frowns upon the fact that they're reversing the conventional scripts of war metaphors, so it remains to be seen uh, how they're doing this and with which, which, uh, which, what effects. And I think finally, and also kind of uh, building on my expertise, I find extremely interesting the new opportunities for creativity that the whole um, Reframe COVID initiative is bringing. So perhaps this is one of the limited silver linings of the whole crisis. And if you can show my yeah. slides. There are several, we have identified some uh, patterns of creativity, but uh, just I wanted to comment on the reversal between source domain and target domain. So we've been talking like almost for over half an hour about metaphors that have the, the crisis as the target domain. So they uh, that make use of other scenarios like war or, or boats or rivers or whatever to explain and reason how the crisis is. But we're starting to see that the virus also acts as a source domain to explore other ideas such as um, the notion of infodemic or how news is spread the same way as a virus. So I, I wanted to highlight this example from The Guardian, the antidote. So they talked about this to refer to this news that have nothing to do with the crisis, with the pandemic, as a, as a kind of escape wave of reality. So that was an interesting example, like the med your doses, uh, daily dose of medicine to um, yeah, get rid of this uh, the, the horrible news. And also, if you move on to the next slide, there was that was another article in Spanish that was about fake news, and it talked about the uh, theory of inoculation, in order to express this idea that uh, you should, uh, in order to come to well to fight fake news, you should teach people how to how fake news are created, the same way that we get vaccines, so we get the virus in our healthy bodies to learn how to fight them and to and to stop them. So we're starting to see new emerging ways of, of creativity that should be further explored. And this is why we need people pay, um, well, thinking about how, what are the best ways to exploit this resource for everyone. So thank you. Uh, just give me a moment with the technicalities. So um, I have to say that this uh, really look uh, uh, exciting to me and uh, um, we hope to see more from your research soon. I think that it's very relevant and, and important. And uh, I also see that we have many comments, so uh, we have uh, some time left. So um, I'd like to open up the discussion now. And and uh, so if you have any question, do ask them in the chat. And um, in, uh, I'll start by giving the floor to those who have contacted me during the week. And in particular today, we have the questions from two of our in this collaborators. So um, the, the first, uh, Vito Evora. Uh, we have some problem with the... Yeah, uh, with your microphone, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks for joining 
Perhaps, Vito, you could just mute your microphone because I have a uh, presentation for you all. No? So thanks for joining us. And um, Vito is a cognitive linguist working at the uh, Nova University of Lisbon within my own institute, uh, Ifilnova and Research Group. So, um, Vito, what would you like yeah. to add? So first of all, thanks for the exciting overview of the data. Um, so I have two questions about the war metaphor and how it's been used. Um, first, the so-called war on the coronavirus, uh, albeit metaphorical, has also been literal and declarative and having an, an immediate change in the state of affairs, right? So presidents have assumed executive powers of wartime presidents, okay. citizens have had their civil rights limited and so on. So these changes of civil affairs have not happened, for example, during other natural calamities without a visible enemy, you know, like hurricanes or earthquakes, but they've uh, only happened during a state of war. So the first question is, would you say that this contemporary usage of war is a sort of literal redefinition or a bleaching via conventionalization of war as a source domain rather than the application of the target domain's metaphoric interpretation. And um, my second question is about the mapping that happens in the COVID is war metaphor. So in the past weeks, um, there's been an ulterior reframing of the war frame, uh, specifically with regards to the citizens who are called to fight the virus, right? Um, whereas in the earlier stages of the pandemic, uh, citizens were urged to fight the virus by staying at home. Now we're starting to see where, you know, some citizens are talking about taking on the enemy by going back to work and trying to return to a pre-COVID normality, putting freedom before fear. So although the same metaphor is still at play, there are different mappings that have radically different real world effects. So have you noticed other remappings of this type? And what can you say about the implications these have on the way we reason about COVID? Who, who, who goes first, Paula? <laughs> you can please go ahead. Yes, please take this. <laughs> you know, I'll take the first question. You don't, if you don't mind, because of course, I mean, um, we, we can even doubt if this is a real, actual metaphor, or if we are facing literal terms, because. I would say it, it, it's, it's a deliberate ambiguity. And um, at, at the very first stage, I mean, uh, politicians might need to legitimize uh, our right cuts. Yeah. So, of course, uh, we are living in an exceptional legal state. And, and it reminds us literally of what our war is. Um, we have presented a very brief overview of, of the data we have, but we are perfectly aware that the source domain might work differently in very, very different contexts, um, depending as well in what uses, who uses this, this world metaphor. So if it's, if it's a politician, we can assume that there is a, an intention to legitimize certain actions. If it's healthcare workers using that metaphor, we are in a different scenario. So we didn't have time to uh, go into these specific, you know, um, differences. But the source domain, the target domain as well, you know, might be structured uh, in detail. And we can see, yeah, really dynamic mappings and some mappings perhaps not being metaphorical, but really literal. Yes. Yes, that's a very yeah, exactly. good point. I wanted to I wanted to build on that. Yeah, because I I also found it quite intriguing after kind of assuming as a given that the war, the word metaphor was so pervasive, I started to watch in the news a conversation on on whether pandemics should be covered within the defense budget and not within the health budget. So that also made me think that perhaps we're talking more literally than we were all thinking. And no one actually rejected this idea from the get-go. Of course, well, you never know with governments, but that was perhaps an indication that this was not as metaphorical anymore and, with, and that perhaps we're facing a new era of wars in the 21st century. So that's a really interesting feature. 
And also with respect to the second question, could you please reformulate it? Am I unmuted now? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, one thing especially I've been noticing in the U.S. American media, you know, they're talking about um, we need to fight, uh, we need to take on the enemy um, by going back to work. Mm -hmm. um, and so our fight is for freedom, not for being healthy, for example. Yeah. So, yeah. so the, um, the metaphor is still there, but the mapping is different, right? Um, so taking on the enemy and, you know, putting uh, freedom before fear and, you know, you as citizens, we need to go back and we need to fight, mm -hmm. and, uh, go back to work and not stay at yeah. home. So yeah. the remapping is is different, right? Definitely. So I, was, I was wondering if, if you noticed other differences of remappings um, in other in other metaphors that you've you know come across, and if you think that there are any implications from you know that come about from the differences of the way that the metaphor is being mapped. Mm -hmm. Do you want to take it, Ines? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, I, I fully agree with you. Uh, we had a first stage in which fighting meant to stay at home, and this was the way we were called to fight. And now, I mean, once we feel that we have flattened the curve, we need to gain territory, we need to gain space. So it's not just a matter of surviving now, it's a matter of gaining what we lost. Mm -hmm. So, of course, I can, I mean, I cannot predict the kind of mapping that will come after this, this second one. Um, it might be perhaps um, 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 a mapping to prevent uh, future pandemics like this one, perhaps, like being, you know, uh, in a military vigilance observation and um, acting as soon as possible for future pandemics. So, of course, as long as we, you know, go along different stages of, of the pandemic, we come up with new mappings. And mm -hmm. now, I mean, we are all pretty concerned about the economic and social impact of that, and we want to regain territory, regain what we lost already, I mean, which is the right to move and the right to work and the right to see our our relatives, our families as well exactly. and friends. Yes. I would, uh, um, I would I want to, to interrupt uh, this conversation now just because I see that we have uh, many other participants, so I'd like to also give time to them. And so the thanks, Vito, for your questions. Uh, can I can I just wrap this up in a very very short sentence? Yeah, yeah because I yeah. thought, and I will. I promise I will be quick. Yeah. The same. I think it's important to bear in mind that war is not just one. This isolated idea is a whole, has a whole narrative, and the same way narratives have an arc, the pandemic has an arc as well. So what was useful at the beginning, like we need to stay home and do nothing and and, and wait and fight. Now it's more about empowerment and resistance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's more about. Yeah. I think. Yeah. The, the, the narrative has changed a bit. So it makes sense. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, so thank you so much, Vito. And um, oh, sorry. So um, the second question came from uh, uh, Sara Biggi, a linguist and expert of medical argumentation from the Catholic University of Milan in Italy. Hi, Sara. Hi. Hi. It's great Hello. to be here. Hi, Ines. Hi, Paola. Hi. Hi. I need to say that Sara um, has helped me a lot uh, uh, with coming up with the idea and the name of this caring discourse series. So thanks a lot, Sara, for all your advice. And surely, uh, caring discourse wouldn't have been the same without your input and feedback. <laughs> and also, I'm sure we'll see more of Sara in the future episode. So thanks to be here today, Thank and uh, I give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Maria Grazia. This is a great initiative and um, I'm really happy to, to be able to, to ask this question to, to Ines and Paola. So uh, metaphors are not precisely my focus of research, uh, but I am a linguist and I followed with great uh, interest and curiosity your initiative. And I'd like to perhaps add a 
an additional perspective to the discussion uh, in the sense that I would like to suggest that this uh, is actually this initiative, your initiative is actually showing a way uh, one of the ways in which linguists uh, could actually contribute to the public discourse and contribute to the health of their communities. We are getting so used to hearing from virologists, epidemiologists, anthropologists, and so on, etc., and other kinds of experts. But it's still difficult to find scholars from the humanities um, find their way into the public debate. And I think this initiative has shown that it is possible and above all, it is relevant. I mean, the, the competences that uh, linguists in particular, but scholars from the humanities have, are relevant. It's not only theories or, or abstract models and concepts. And I would like to hear your, uh, your opinion on this. Ines, this is right up your street. I think you should address this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have to say I, I work um, um, in, a, in a research institute uh, that really wants to be part of the society and to um, answer questions that are relevant for everybody. So, I mean, the, the transferability of our research, I mean, the way of, you know, explaining and making our knowledge, you know, understandable, I mean, that, that's really really important but it's not easy i have to say mm -hmm. um and we also i have to acknowledge i mean we, we need the media we need journalists as well so they are actually i mean necessary mediators in that it doesn't mean that we cannot reach a wider audience through twitter but i have to say that we, we got a bigger impact when journalists I mean, these, these mediators did also their, their job. I mean, interviewing us and making us, you know, explain things in a clear way. So it's, it's a, it's a really nice, um, uh, interplay. I mean, interaction with them as well. So, uh, yes, we need more initiatives that are, or, I mean, that can be, acknowledge as um, being close to the citizens and yeah. I think that's part of our our job as well the risk is being taken as prescriptors as people saying you are talking or nonsense or this is not a good correct way of expressing things so we are also trying to <laughs> you yeah. know find that view because it's not about um, telling people what to say and how to talk it's about making people aware uh, of what they already know as well. I mean, mm -hmm. perhaps, I mean, they, they were feeling anxious about this war framing and we are trying to put that into words. So with the help of journalists, with the help of cartoonists and, you know, uh, with the help of social media as well, Twitter, yeah. I mean, yeah, thanks exactly. Twitter. Thanks, Twitter. Yeah. And thanks also this um, Google Doc collaborative spreadsheet uh, which is actually managed by, by Pernille Bogo, <laughs> I have to say. I mean, she's doing all the technicalities. So there are lots of virtual spaces where we can interact with citizens as well. I think yeah, the, I lockdown, is, yeah, the lockdown yeah. speeded up this process because as yeah. we were taking out from our usual scenarios, like conferences or universities and so on, yeah. we were kind of, we, everyone kind of shifted towards Twitter and it was easier to get access to journalists um in, yeah. in in social in social media rather than in our usual places so yeah. because i think in the end we all share we all share the same concerns and interest but it's except so we need to get over the initial barriers like perhaps linguists are more worried about the labels journalists about uh super fast processes but deep down we care about the same thing so perhaps the lockdown made us uh converge in the in the same place which was twitter so not to be missed yes definitely Absolutely, and also the fact that your research, uh, your research, your initiative shows the value of collaborative research. Uh, we were not used to working this way. I mean, we did have research groups, but uh, we all know how difficult it is to uh, to put together a research group and uh, to make it work internationally and so on. So, uh, sharing data above all. So, I think this is a very good example of of a way of doing it. This is why we are also stressing all it. I mean, you know, uh, during this conversation, we are saying this is not our our thing. I mean, and there is a series of you know amazing linguists, 
you know, uh, sending comments. And these are also part of the Reframe COVID initiative. This is why we are worried uh, about saying, please uh, bear in mind that we are, you know, a, a big group of people bringing ideas and, and trying to interact uh, with each other. The academic outcomes or the scientific outcomes will be varied free, open, everybody will be free to shape, I mean, whatever uh, mm -hmm. article or uh, conference presentation or whatever. Uh, this is collaborative and, and, and I mean, this is why we want to credit everybody as well. Mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> so, and the names are, are, are there, I mean, the live yeah. comments, I mean, we are really happy to have um, um, those people here. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, thank you. Uh, before before we wind up, uh, we still have some time for a few more questions. Uh, Sara, please uh, feel free to stay uh, here with Thank us. Thank you. Uh, with us. Um, uh, perhaps you could also help me um, in this second part, because uh, I've seen that we um, have had uh, a parallel discussion on, on the um, chat, so I, I will look into it also uh, after the event. Um, perhaps, uh, so I start with the uh, first question that uh, I am able to see in the chat, but please, if uh, um, uh, write down, write down again the question if uh, I'm missing something. So, uh, first question, first part of the first question. Yeah, Silvia Ross is asking, what do you think of scientific communication? I'm thinking more about researchers than doctors. And the second part, which kind of metaphors is used in this field? Why, which relationship with political media, economical communication? So, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, well, I, I would say um, whenever I I am interviewed, it's not that I'm a cinema star. I mean, it, it's because I mean, uh, my my communications department uh, do, does a great job, and I, you know, I, I interact with journalists. So, the feeling I get is that we want to talk about our stuff, and they want to talk about their stuff. So we need to find an intermediate point between bringing up uh, interesting headlines and coming up with, you know, straight ideas while not losing all these, you know, nuances that we love in scientific communication. So it's yeah. not easy to find a balance between not saying like big broad things <clears throat> which are not true <laughs> and being also uh, attractive for the audience. So yeah, I think sorry. No, no, there go is, ahead, Paula. Yeah, there is a, a bit of that's a bit problematic, isn't it? Because in principle, science should be unbiased or working yeah. not hand in hand with polit politics. And an interesting example, there was a bit of a debate here in Spain because uh, Fernando Simon, which is the head scientist, like giving these addresses, explaining how the crisis is evolving, he was uh, he was uh, um, cr uh, humiliated and criticized for not having a straightforward answer to a specific questions addressed by one of the journalists. And uh, that is a bit of a shame because we cannot expect the scientists to give headlines every five minutes. And also we cannot expect scientists to kind of be used as a shield for politicians not doing their job, which should be communicating in a, in a much more, well, kind of efficient or straightforward way. Not efficient, but perhaps a uh, conclusive way, because science cannot be, science is not political communication. And not at all, yeah. Yeah. I think there was another question. Yeah. Uh, in, I hear it. it yeah, how can these results, metaphor and data, be used in other contexts, not just public discourse, media, etc., but teaching, for example? Good question. I mean, wow, lovely idea. Thank you, Iraide. And I, I and we heard about initiatives using this Reframe COVID, uh, to teach uh, language and to teach, I mean, the power of metaphor. And sure, I mean, this is also citizen science. We want to be useful as well uh, for students um, who, I mean, language students, for instance, are big. Um, I mean, they, they reflect, you know, deeply upon language as well. So we have to also boost that uh, reflective dimension of teaching using, for instance, nowadays examples, current examples, live initiatives like this, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Good. Um, yeah, another way, so besides language, which is kind of the obvious fo focus, I think another interesting way would be to teach uh, emotional emotions. I think I've been having conversations in the past few weeks about, this is of course like kindergarten children, mm -hmm. but the importance about teaching uh, how to handle emotions and how to express emotions and sure. metaphor for sure is one of the kind of the most amazing tools to do so, especially if you combine it with images. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So another question, uh, Elisa says, I missed the first part. I was wondering if you have considered what kind of metaphors were used in other pandemics. I was thinking about the Spanish flu for which the metaphor of war was probably less adequate since it happened mm -hmm. during World War I. It might mm -hmm. be interesting to see what kind of metaphor were, metaphors were used back then. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Uh -huh. Paula, please. Well, uh, it's not, no, I haven't, I have to be oh. honest, and I have not looked into that, but um, the thing this is... Could be, uh, sorry, this could be a spin-off study of yeah. Uh, yeah. comparing, yeah. Yeah. but yeah, I came, I came across um, cartoons as well. I mean, they can be kind of a, a good place to compare. And yeah. um, I mean, there was, I mean, Vito Evola was suggesting, I mean, is this literal or not? I mean, uh, are we at war or not? So, I mean... I, I guess that was a really, really fruitful period to reflect upon that. And I came across some cartoons comparing the Spanish flu as well with the war. What's the problem? I mean, there was an actual war going on <laughs> these days. So I guess the level of meta reflection was extremely high, even higher than today. Yeah. But I, I mean, we haven't looked at that, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> we have compared. I would say we read this last question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. so what are interesting ways to continue bringing reframe COVID to the mainstream discourse and the general public? Well, for me, the most amazing ones, uh, Ines mentioned that, is cartoons. For yeah. me, that's the next step. Right, and how, true, how yeah. does humor, uh, what is the role of humor in this whole thing? Because we always yeah. say that humor is cathartic, but it can also be, it has way more functions. So it's also another way to um, reverse the standards to bring to the four alternative frames and to bring to the four uh, kind of alternative ways to think about this that are not kind of uh, that widespread. So I think it's yeah. very interesting the way the way scripts are being reversed in cartoons and satires. Mm -hmm. And I get the feeling that cartoonists, I mean, they have this this really subtle, you know, sense of you know grasping what's actually salient and relevant at at all at all times yeah. and there's an evolution i've been talking to some of them to some of the spanish ones in, in, the, in the last days i mean they they have their own timeline and they say well this is an old cartoon don't pay attention to that because they they have a sense of how all this is evolving and how they are reflecting um on all this so the, the difference between staying at home and now fighting to regain territory. I mean, they grasp it really, really well. It's a creative, visual, um, cathartic way, cathartic way of, of, you know, reframing reality. So if we can, you know, uh, make people, that kind of people join the initiative and other people as well, I mean, um, I mean, we will be very happy, I think. And also, I have to say gestures, because it wasn't until yesterday that I was involved in a super interesting thread about the gestures, the metaphorical gestures that have emerged in, in the pandemic. And I was just thinking that we already know all these um, new greetings and salutations, but they're not necessarily metaphorical. But as I showed with this example of the closed fist, it's also it's now time of looking in depth into gestures and audiovisual data, because it's true that mm -hmm. Reframe COVID has lots of verbal data, but not that much uh, cartoons, as we said, but especially, especially gestures and all the multimodal data of another multimodal nature. So that mm -hmm. would be super interesting as well. Yeah. TV data, TV data, please. Yeah. <laughs> Where everybody's yeah. involved. Yes, citizens, yeah. politicians, journalists. I mean, that's that's the place to go, I think. Yeah. So, thank you very much. I see that uh, we have uh, other comments. I don't know if perhaps I missed also questions, but uh, unfortunately we don't have the time now. But uh, in essence, Paula, I've already agreed to reply to your questions and comments on our current discourse social, social media, media accounts. So, um, 
uh, in the next few days. So if you have uh, uh, other questions or comments, or if we missed some questions, uh, feel free to ask them via uh, Twitter using the hashtag uh, ReframeCovid and the hashtag Green Discourse, uh, on, uh, or also feel free to uh, post something on our uh, Facebook uh, Caring Discourse page, and uh, we'll try to get back to you as soon uh, as possible. <laughs> Yes, we will. We will. We'll type or, I mean, we are yeah. looking forward to you know continuing the conversation in, yeah. in different kind of way. way. Yeah, yeah. It's um, just a pity that we didn't have time for. There were really amazing questions. We will come back. Yeah. Yeah. Also, really amazing comment uh, comments. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, this is the right time to say that, that uh, I would also love uh, to hear from uh, from you. Uh, um, uh, from the public about what you think about future topics uh, and speakers uh, as well as the general format of carrying discourse so please let me know let us know something and um, uh, I would uh, uh, use uh, uh, to conclude. Um, uh, I would say that uh, um, Karin discourse will go live uh, again on the first of June during the afternoon. This time we'll talk about communication in the context of cancer healthcare. Our guest experts will be Elena Semino from Lancaster University and Monique Lille, coordinator of the Universidade de Psico-Oncologia do Nucleo Regional do Norte, da Liga Portuguesa contro o, o Cancro. It uh, will be a rich conversation where we uh, will uh, discuss the metaphor of menu for uh, people living with cancer the activities carried out by the Portuguese Association and much more. Uh, so thanks uh, again, uh, Ines and Paula. And um, I know we all have uh, um, really enjoyed this uh, conversation about the uh, hashtag the Reframe COVID movement, because I think that it's a movement. And um, thanks again also to you, Sarah, for your valuable collaboration and friendship. Thank you. Thank you all. And I have uh, to say thank you for inviting us, but more importantly, thanks to everyone who is contributing to the whole yeah. initiative. Yeah, because that's the most yeah. important thing. That is yeah. a collaborative effort. Yeah. Yes, a big thank you to, to everybody. And thank you, Maria Grazia, Sara. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's been a real pleasure. Uh, to be here, everything was so well organized, and I mean, we are really happy. I mean, it was it was great. Thank you, thanks Thank for you. for organizing this. So finally, thanks. thanks to you who have actively participated or, or even just listened from your homes. I want to thank you for your time and the interest. Um, I really do mean it. Uh, thanks for your ac active participation and support. And uh, of course, I hope to see you again for another edition of uh, Caring Discourse. So, ciao. Ciao, ciao. We will. Ciao. Bye. Ciao, ciao. Thank you.